Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As is my habit, I most often preach out of the pulpit, so I take the time to come down to you. So our text is uh, the baptism of Jesus according to St. Luke, the third chapter. And uh, the emphasis is on baptism. We are baptized like a baby, like Daniel said, you need blah, 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 and a baby. That might have happened, I would think, for many of us, that we were brought to faith as an infant, um, and, our bapt and the baptismal waters brought to faith. And um, Jesus was baptized, but for different reasons. And there's a connection between the two. But let me start out with a fact you already know, that the Imperial Valley at least this is what I read on billboards all around the place, is the winter vegetable capital of the nation. Or the world, I don't know. Nation's big enough. And so as you, I drive around this area, and as you do, maybe some of you work the land, you have these uh, beautiful fields of vegetables, often uh, leafy vegetables like cauliflower, yum yum, and broccoli, and uh, lettuce, and maybe some... Onions. I'm so tempted, but I know it's against the law and against God's law for to stop the car and go out and pick a head. I should at least ask permission. But I, normally I go to the grocery store and I buy the things there. But these, if I went out into the field and picked a, a head of one of these winter vegetables, it would be a, often it's a leafy, a leafy thing. And I wouldn't necessarily um, eat the outer leaves, right? I would kind of pull them apart and get to the to the heart of the, of the fruit or the vegetable. Like when you pick sweet corn, at least I see it in the city, when people pick sweet corn, they take all the husk off. That kind of irritates me. It's like, but they want to see if the fruit, inside, the fruit inside is good. So the same thing with the head of cabbage. It has layers, and onions, it has layers. In uh, biology class, I remember one of our first simple projects was to un examine underneath a microscope uh, uh, the onion skin, onion skin, and you wouldn't take the big thick skin on the outside, you wouldn't even do that now, and I've noticed after you cut an onion, it kind of dehydrates, and the onion, the good part of the onion kind of shrinks, so it's layered, and as I mentioned last week, that's what the epiphany season is, we take off a layer at a time, we take off a leaf at a time, to see who this Jesus in the manger is, last week we took off the outer the outer leaves, the first unwrapping of Jesus, and we discovered that a wise man from the east came to see Jesus. So Jesus was for the world. The star in heaven guiding these Persians, or these wise men from the east, um, tells us that the baby in the manger is not just for a sect or a group or an ethnic group, but for the world. And for five weeks now, four more weeks, during the season of Epiphany, during the unwrapping of Jesus, we're going to take off layer by layer and look at who this Jesus is and what it means to you and to me. We'll end uh, the first Sunday in February with the transfiguration of Jesus, which is a marvelous insight into, well, come back on February 7th and we'll talk about that then. Today, we're out in the field picking the... The, the head of the cabbage or the onion or whatever it is, and we're going to take off another set of leaves. And these leaves are set in the context of John the Baptist at the Jordan River, and lo and behold, who shows up? It's the Lord Jesus himself, and we're watching him. He chooses to be baptized. And what does that say, and what does that mean? Before we get to the actual event, which is only one verse, one sentence at the end of the gospel lesson, there's a whole preamble, a whole context of what's going on before Jesus is baptized. And what's going on is there's a lot of activity at the baptismal font of the Jordan River. And John the Baptist is doing a lot of preaching and baptizing a ton of people and the people put this together. They know he's a man from God. And they start wondering and asking themselves and each other, could this be the Messiah? The Messiah prophesied in the Old Testament of the one who is to come to deliver themselves and us. 
Everybody has a need to be delivered, to be rescued. Some people have said Christianity is not so much about what you get. You know, some people, they convert to Christianity, and they think their lives will be a piece of cake. They'll be prosperous, they'll make a lot of money, all their problems will be solved. That's not necessarily true. It may happen, it may not happen. But you can be assured of this, that Christianity is a religion from what you escape. So if you lead a boring life like I do, don't fret. Because what you and I have is a rescue from some really bad stuff. And John the Baptist uh, was um, talking about things like that. And they thought he might be the Messiah who would rescue us from really bad stuff. Rescue them from really bad stuff. He reminded the people, the Baptist did, before the Lord Jesus appeared on the scene, that God has an angry side to him. It's like mom and dad, right? You love your kids to death. You probably battled with the problem, well, it's like, do I love them too much? Am I giving them too much? Should I set restrictions and how should I enforce them? My mom and dad were good at that. They were good at it, but I had a good childhood, okay? And and the, and the set restrictions on your children is an important part of parenting. God has set restrictions on us. It's an important part of his being the father of us, the creator of the world, and to set restrictions so we would leave, lead not self-destructive lives. Have you looked around at people that are kind of in trouble? The decisions they make are almost all self-destructive. And they flip from one marriage to another. They, they entertain breaking the law. They break the law. They have addictions. They misuse their money. They're manipulative. Those are all self-destructive behaviors. And God gets mad at us, his children, when we just go our own way. Someone has said for the last 300 years, the church has not been preaching the wrath of God. They had it down in medieval times when God, when God the Father was perceived, correctly so, maybe they overemphasized it, that he is angry with sin and with people who sin. And now in these modern times, we don't talk about it very much. Someone has said that churches and Christians are people. People kind of, they'll admit that there's a God and he created us, but now leave us alone. Leave us alone. Don't be involved in my daily life. Don't be involved at school. Don't be involved at work. Don't be involved in the way I spend money. And God doesn't want it that way. Sometimes I say to my wife, confessing my sins here, I'll say, guess what I decided to do? She rolls her eyes. And she goes, now what? And as I decided to make, I decided to do blah, 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 blah. It's a fairly big decision, okay? And she looks at me and she says, did you ever think about praying about it? That's the way God wants it. He wants to be invited in our daily lives to have conversation. And we don't do that anymore. And the Baptist said, uh, confronted the people of his time with the same thing that God is angry when we go our own way. It was Shakespeare. I think it was in the play Othello, the king who had two daughters, and the daughter who thought, the daughter the king thought was really supportive of him wasn't. She was the bad girl. And the other daughter who, who did support him and truly loved her father, he, you know, he was hard on her. And then so Shakespeare said, sharper, then a serpent's tooth is a thankless child. We're thankless children. That's what the Baptist said. And it hurts God. And it hurts God. And the Baptist would say things like this. Well, someday the Lord is going to pick up his pitchfork, winnowing fork. I think a pitchfork is made to move dirt, to spade dirt. A winnowing fork is to separate. The, the tines are further apart. So you get this pitchfork, uh, this winnowing fork. He says, a time will come when the Lord will take his winnowing fork and he'll go into the barn and he'll pick up one load of hay 
or grain after another. And what do they do with it? They throw it as high as they can, as high as they can. And what happens? Grain kernels are heavier than the straw. So what happens to the grain and the kernels? They fall flat to the floor. And what happens to the straw, which is lighter? Well, the breeze through the barn hits the chaff, the straw, which is not sellable, uh, and blows it away. And they gather up the grain, and they sell that, and they sweep together the, the chaff, the straw, which is useless. And what do they do with that? They burn it. That's, that's the way the Lord feels about sin. The Lord feels about sin. So he's preaching things like that. He was showing both sides of God, which we still need to hear. And people are asking, are you the Messiah, the one to come? And the Baptist says, no, 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 no. There is one mightier. That's the good news. Up to this point, it's been kind of judgment news, bad news. Hmm? We are, if we're not careful, headed for the bonfire of the straw. The good news is the Baptist says, no, 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 there's one mightier than I. The laces of his shoes I'm unworthy to untie or to tie. And he will come and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, with faith, forgiveness of sins, life, salvation, and with fire. And then, um, then what happens? Well, the Baptist confronts Herod. He confronts Herod which might have been a political mistake, and he ends up in prison. But before that happens, Jesus comes, and he is baptized. Baptized in the font, like I said, of the Jordan River, had the word of God, had water, and you had the baptismal candidate. But he was baptized not for forgiveness of sins. He had no sin. He was baptized. I think he was anointed or installed. This afternoon there is an installation of a pastor at Zion Bly. My wife and I are planning on going. Next, this summer, uh, God willing, you will be installing a ca called candidate to be your pastor. I was installed in a little ceremony here um, a couple of months ago, which uh, is the um, ratification, the start the official acknowledgement that public minister on your behalf, Jesus was installed, commissioned to start his ministry, not for the forgiveness of sins. We, the forget. Jane and I were on a boat trip once several years ago. It would take about an hour for the boat after we got on to get to the destination. During that hour, uh, one, of the, the, one of the crew members decided to entertain us. And he was going to do the limbo. Remember that? So he was a skinny guy, you know, looked fairly athletic, no body fat. Don't look at me that way, please. Okay. And he'd set the limbo right on the deck where the people were sitting around, right on the, the deck of the boat. And he'd set the limbo stick. And he st I thought he'd start up here. I can't walk under a tree. Okay, I thought he would set it up here. No, he sets it about this high, waist high. And I go, well, I'd be, I'm out. I couldn't do that. And to <clears throat> accelerate the story, for the next 40 minutes or so, he, with great drama and flair, go under the limbo stick. And he'd succeed, and he'd lower it more. And he'd lower it more. And he'd lower it to where I thought was impossible and past impossible to get under the limbo stick. My word, do you remember that? I think the final time, and I said, he cannot possibly get under the limbo stick. Could not have been more than six inches off the ground. Six inches off the ground. My gut is 12 inches. Okay. And he got down there, and he was walking on his ankles. He was walking on his ankles. That's the only place to go, because the balls of his feet were too hot. He'd walk, and he got under it. It was amazing. Of course, then I felt obligated to tip him, because he did it. All right. Jesus went under the limbo stick of humanity, 
and God's expectation for us to live. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the fulfilling of the law. I don't know about you. I do know about you. You're not that loving. And neither am I. You're nice people. And I'm nice people too. But if you ask me to do something and I'm not in the mood, ask me to love you by doing something, I'll find a way to say no. I get about this far down under the limbo stick. Jesus went, all the way, include, including death and hell by being baptized. That's what his baptism was about. The anointing and the resources, the Holy Spirit, to get on with his job of dying for the sins of the world, to suffering hell, way down here, so we didn't have to do that. He shares his baptism with us. And your baptism, Romans chapter 6, tells us, I'll do this quickly, but it's important, ties us to that event. Do you not know that we who were baptized were baptized into death? And even as he was buried in the tomb, so were we. And just as he was risen from the dead, so we too should rise to newness of life. Your baptism puts you on the cross of Christ. It's like, I know that doesn't make sense. Like, you weren't hanging on a cross, but that's what it says. When you were baptized, you were nailed to the cross of Christ. And when Jesus came down from the cross and Joseph and those other guys put him in the borrowed tomb, you went right along with him. And you stayed in the tomb for three days. I know what you're saying. You say, oh, he's talking spiritually. No. You were really there. And then on the third day when the earthquake took place and the angels came down and the stone was rolled away, you were there. You rose, you rose from the dead to newness of life. To newness of life. God is angry. God is angry with good reason. He's angry with our sinfulness since they do nothing else than gnaw at the wholeness of our being and threaten us with death, temporal, and eternal punishment. The Baptist's last word, hmm, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hmm. And the Father's word of delight, this is my beloved Son, is for us because it tells us Jesus' installation and in our baptism go hand in hand and we escape the bad stuff so die to sin die to sin it'll spend a lifetime doing it but there's something in your life which needs to die it has take it back to the cross take it back to the tomb Take it back to the grave. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your, keep your remembering your baptism and its ties with the baptism, the anointing, the commissioning of our Lord into life everlasting. Amen. We'll gather our...